Yes, and now we will talk about service reli reliability through uh, subscribing uh, auto-scaling workloads on Kubernetes with Ara. Hello, Ara. Hello, how are you doing, Mindy? I'm doing very really well. Uh, yeah, thank you for being there with us. And I propose that uh, you share your slides, you put them full screen, and so we can enjoy your presentation for the next 20 minutes. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so thanks for having me in APA Days New York. Um, my name is um, Ara Pulida. I'm a technical evangelist at Datadog, a company called Datadog. Uh, that's my Twitter handler. If you want to um, ask uh, any questions afterwards, um, I'm always happy to answer questions through, through that medium. And today we are going to be talking about how to get reliability on your API services that are running on Kubernetes using auto-scaling. Uh, so um, just so you know, the company that I work for, Datadog is a monitoring and analytics platform that helps companies improve the observability of their infra and applications, including, of course, Kubernetes clusters and also the workloads that you run on top of um, Kubernetes. In case you're not familiar with Kubernetes, Kubernetes is in a container orchestration platform that help you run containerized applications, for example, containerized API-driven services in Kubernetes in production, sorry, in production. Um, it's a completely open source project. It's part of the CNCF. Uh, it's super, super successful. Successful. There are a lot of companies contributing to the code. Uh, so if you want to run containers in production and you haven't used Kubernetes yet, probably something to, to check out. So, but today we are going to be talking about scaling and scaling in Kubernetes. And when we talk about scaling in Kubernetes, we can be talking about two very different things. We can be talking about scaling your cluster. So if you have a cluster of Kubernetes, let's say with five nodes, Scaling the cluster would mean to, for example, add more nodes, add more VMs uh, to that cluster, or increasing the size of the nodes that you already have. So increasing the CPU, memory, choose a bigger um, VM for it. Or we can be talking about scaling your workloads. So the scaling the applications that you're running on top of Kubernetes. And that's, that's going to be the focus for today's presentation. Obviously, cluster scaling is also important, but that's a completely different topic. Good. In case you're new to Kubernetes, I'm going to start by uh, describing three things in Kubernetes uh, that are very basic. Uh, so if you're not new to Kubernetes, this might be repetitive, but it's going to be quick, and it's going to make sure that everybody can follow along. Uh, so the first concept that I want to talk about is the pod, and the pod is the minimal deployable unit uh, in Kubernetes, and it's basically one or more containers that share the same networking namespace, and therefore they can talk to each other um, through local hosts if they want to. Um, but from a scaling point of view, it's important because it's also the minimal scalable unit. So when you want to create more units of your pod, more replicas, as it's called in Kubernetes, you cannot say, okay, give me two more units of this particular container in my pod. You have to scale it in a block. Like every pod is going to be its own block. So that's, that's important to know. The other one is service uh, in Kubernetes. So because you can have several replicas of your workload, you need something to load balance the traffic between all those different pods. And that's the way to achieve that is through a Kubernetes service. Um, the third concept that I'm going to be talking about very, very, very high level is how Kubernetes schedule pods in your nodes. So let's let's imagine that you have here a five node cluster and you want to schedule a new pod. That's the yellow box um, over there. The way you do that is by describing that pod, describing what container image you're going to run, uh, describing the amount of CPU and memory that you're going to need, et cetera, et cetera. And you send that description to the API server. This is very high level. There are a lot of things that happen in between, but more or less, uh, once you have that description, there is another component called the scheduler that based on that description of your pod is going to pick which node to deploy that, um, that pod to, like what is the best match for this particular pod. 
Cool. Uh, so I'm going to be running a demo uh, to explain some of this concept. The demo is pre-recorded, but I recorded it uh, myself, uh, but it's we don't have enough time to do it live. But basically, it's a 118 cluster uh, with just a single node using Minikube. Obviously, we need a workload, an API-driven workload, because that's what we are talking about here today. So we will be using an e-commerce application. And we are going to be using Datadog to get some metrics and use those metrics to decide uh, those scaling events. So this is our, our uh, application. So basically, this is um, a front-end monolith, let's say, um, that it's super big. This is two API-driven services, discounts and, and ads, and it's all backed up by um, a Postgres database. And we'll be using uh, Datadog again to gather all those metrics and use those metrics to drive those scaling events. And the way you monitor a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster with Datadog is by deploying what we call a node agent. And the node agent is going to be on every single node of your cluster, gathering information about the containers that are running, the CPU and memory that is being used on that node, et cetera, et cetera. And we will be deploying as well the cluster agent. And the cluster agent is a little bit different. It's going to be used to mostly to gather data about the API server itself. OK, let's start by um, doing the setup of the demo. It's just uh, to show you what we have. So we have this application, the e-commerce application that we saw up and running with the different services that, that we talk about. Um, we have the node agent running. Again, the node agent runs on every node, but because we only have one node, we only have one node agent. And we also have the cluster agent running uh, already. So we are already gathering a lot of data, a lot of metrics, and send them to Datadog. This is the e-commerce application. So it's just a simple e-commerce app with serving ads and discounts. And it's already pre-instrumented for APM, so for distributed tracing. And because of that, for every request, we can have data like the latency on every service, the number of requests per second that we are getting. We can connect all the dots together and get a full trace of the requests that the user is doing and have a visual way to, to see um, where the latency is happening, um, the service, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. So that's the demo, um, the the setup of the demo. And when we when we're talking about scaling in the workloads, we can be talking also about two different things: vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. Vertical scaling in Kubernetes is not exactly uh, what we think about vertical scaling when we talk about, for example, a VM, which is adding a CPU, adding memory, make it bigger. Um, in vertical, vertical scaling in Kubernetes is cool like that, but it's not really vertical scaling. It only refers to the amount of CPU and memory that you request for your pod. So when you're describing your pod, you have to request CPU and memory. And these numbers are important, but it's so sometimes difficult to know what to request. So the vertical pod or the scaler, the only thing that it does is start gathering data about your pods and give you a recommendation. So in ex this example, for example, we, we are requesting 500 millicore for a pod. We run the vertical pod or the scaler, start gathering data about uh, CPU usage of my pod. And after a while, it says, OK, actually, you're going to make do perfectly fine with 200 millicore in case you want to edit. So that's a vertical pod or the scaler. It's not really vertical scaling. So we are going to be focusing on real scaling today, which is horizontal scaling. And what is horizontal scaling? Uh, so basically, the number of replicas you have for a pod. Let's imagine here that you have a pod, two replicas of the same workload, same pod, and you want a third one. So how do you do that? Again, by talking to the API server, the same thing. Um, there is two ways to do it imperatively, saying, OK, give me one more replica. Oh, the best practice in Kubernetes is using a declarative way to say to the API server, the end result that I want is to have three replicas. So again, this is very high level, 
But um, the controller, it's another component in the control plane in Kubernetes, is going to say, okay, the API server is telling me that I need three replicas. How many do I have already up and running? I have two. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell the scheduler to schedule a new replica. So that, that way we can make sure that the three replicas that the user wanted um, are already up and running. This is basically horizontal scaling, nothing, nothing more. And it's something that you can do manually. And if you're a, a cluster administrator, you can do uh, change the finishing of your pod, of your deployment, add more replicas, uh, or do kubectl scale. All of that, you can do it manually. But obviously, it makes a lot of sense to make data-driven decisions, and even better if this can be automatic. And this is how you do it. Um, the, that's what the horizontal pod autoscaler tries to solve. Um, on its more basic, most basic uh, way of working, it tries to answer this, this question. How many replicas of a pod do I need based on resource usage? How does it work? So again, when you define your workload, you request a number of CPU and memory. And you want to make sure that if you get a spikes, um, it's still going to behave correctly. So you can create an HPA object, a horizontal product scalar object with this definition, basically saying, if the CPU of my pod, of my deployment, goes above, on average, 50% of what I requested, add more replicas. Let's see quickly a demo to see this in, if I can find where I'm. So basically, we are requesting 100 millicore. And we are creating this new object, horizontal pod or the scalar, that says, if it goes above 20%, Please scale it up to three. And I make a little bit of, uh, it was a little bit of cheating because 20% is already too low for us. You can see that I'm already using 44% of what I requested initially. So what it's going to happen at that point is the auto scaler is going to say, okay, I need to create more replicas up to uh, the three that I requested. And this is what happened there. For me, without having to do anything, the cluster itself decided that we needed more replicas for this. So this is more or less how it's going to look like um, in, in a monitoring system. So you can see that we've been increasing the number of replicas. And once we remove the HPA autoscaler, it drops down quickly. So that's that's how more or less it works. And it's a good start. You can scale based on based on that. But basically, um, it's not what your users, your API users care about. They don't really know what CPU and memory you're using. They really don't care. They care more about all the type of metrics, like the four golden signals, the latency, the time it takes a request, number of errors that we are getting, the traffic that, that we are getting, whether we are getting a lot of traffic or a spike in traffic that we need to react to, um, the saturation or the number of requests that we cannot um, proceed. All those things affect directly to the user experience of your API users. So that's a lot better uh, to use for that. And that's exactly what the HPA allow you to do with custom metrics or with external metrics it basically tries to answer the questions, how many replicas do I need based on any single metric value? And it can be using custom metrics, so metrics that are running on your uh, cluster, or external metrics, really any metric that you can get from any service out there. And how does it do that? The external metric server basically is a specification. It's a specification part of the Kubernetes project that any monitoring solution can implement. Datadog implements it through the cluster agent that we saw previously. And basically, it allows you to say, OK, for any metric that I need for my scaling decisions, put it in a way that the, the HPA can understand. So the HPA is a way to make sure that no matter what that metric, where that metric comes from, 
the HPA is going to understand it. With the HPA with external metric server, you can do things that are a lot more interesting. Like for example, we have this metric and data dog in our application for the latency because we have APM enabled in our application. So we can say things like, if the latency goes above seven seconds on average for our replicas, please increase those replicas, which seems to be a lot more uh, interesting to do. Let's, let's see a demo of that. Um, so again, because we have APM, we can see that the latency for the front end service is 5.6 more or less. So we are going to tell it, create this object, the HPA between one and three replicas for the P99 latency, which is something that I really care about. And if it goes above six seconds, please scale it. Again, the only thing that I have to do is to define that object obviously create that metric, have that metric in the first place. And once you have that metric, it's going to start getting the metric value. We can see that it's more or less the same value that we were seeing on that service map. And it's below six seconds. So we are going to create fake traffic. Like we are mimicking that it's the first day of sales. So this is what is going to happen. What is going to happen is that as soon as we create that traffic, its latency is going to go up and you can see that the different uh, replicas going to, uh, up. And then once we remove that fake traffic, it goes down as well. So that's uh, a lot better from my point of view uh, because now you can use metrics that the users care about. And, and we saw how we set a value and it goes up, uh, it scales up. And if it goes down after a time, it will go down. And it seems to be, if you're using a metric that changes a lot, um, it can be a little bit too radical. You go up and then you go down and maybe up again. Uh, for To improve a little bit how the HPA works, uh, Datadog has created an open source project. It's completely open source. Anybody can use it. Uh, called the Watermark Port Autoscaler. It's basically an extension of the HPA, which actually gives you two values in, for the metric instead of one. It gives you a high watermark and a low water watermark and basically says that in between those two values do not create any scaling events. So you can say things like, if my latency goes above seven seconds, please scale. But if it goes, uh, and not until it goes below my low watermark, for example, four seconds, do not scale down. And that way you're able to have this ban in which uh, you're not having scaling events and you can stabilize your service a little bit. It has some other um, features like a scaling velocity. You can say uh, how fast you want that scaling to happen, how many replicas at a time you want to scale up or down, and also cooldown periods, like how long you want to wait in between scaling events so you have enough time you leave enough time to your service to stabilize after that scaling event. Cool, let's let's watch this final demo uh, with the watermark. Um, again, this is an open source project um, and we have it here up and running, the watermark port with its killer controller. We have it here up and running. It's, it's an external component, so we have to deploy it. And once we deploy it, we can create this new type of object, which is my report as a scalar, and say, okay, with a minimum of one replica and nine uh, for the front end service again, if the, again, P99 latency goes above seven seconds, please scale up, but only scale down if it goes below four seconds. Um, so we are going, same thing, we are going to apply that object. And uh, once that happens, and after a while, uh, we are going to do the same thing. We are going to create fake traffic that it's going to, again, mimic, for example, um, the a, a big event that you have. So once you have that and you have applied that fake traffic, uh, this is what we see. And this is a little bit different from what we saw on the HPA1. So we start the fake traffic, the latency automatically goes up because our pod is unable to tackle all the requests that it's having. So thanks to the WPA, we are going to start seeing this up step by step. And here's the difference. So at this point, 
what we are doing here is dropping that fake traffic. Like suddenly nobody's buying anything on our e-commerce app, all the traffic dropped. And you can see that it didn't drop the number of replicas. And the reason is because we chose a four second value for the low watermark and because our latency never goes below those four seconds, it stays with the last replica that, that we saw, which is six replicas. And that way we can ensure that if our traffic, it's going to go up very soon, anytime soon, we are still, we already have those so replicas uh, up and running. Okay, um, I hope uh, some takeaways, I hope this was uh, interesting. Uh, the first takeaway is the vertical port of the scaler helps you decide how much CPU and memory you have to request for your pod. It's not really auto scaling. Um, but the real auto scaler is the HPA, which can automatically scale your pod horizontally, creating more replicas or less replicas based on data, on resource data, or based on any metric that you can think of, any metric that you have in your monitoring system, thanks to the external metric uh, server provider. And finally, if you think that just one value um, is not enough for your use case, it depends a lot on the metric that you're going to use, you can have a look to the watermark port auto scaler, which is open source and allows you, for example, to put two values to, to, your, uh, to your metric, like the high watermark and the, and the low watermark. And that way you can fine tune a little bit more your, your scaling events. Cool, uh, so thanks very much. Uh, I, ha I have time for questions. Again, if you think of a question afterwards that you are not able to, to ask here, reach, reach out. Um, I'm always happy to, to discuss things related to Kubernetes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ara. We have some comments about the fact that the Kubernetes API is too big, do too much things, and it's too hard to use. Do you agree? It is. Um, one of the things that, um, so the, 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 I, I think the Kubernetes upstream team is actually thinking about, it was, they were thinking about design wise a couple of years ago, we split it in somehow, this hasn't happened yet. Um, but one of the things that uh, they're trying to do is, is um, creating, being able to create extensions through webhooks. So the API server, um, can do a lot of things, but you can also extend some things through webhooks. Um, so yeah, it's 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 big, but um, you can fine tune it a little bit. Yeah, one question about the, the w, WPA uh, tool you presented. Why I would uh, not have just a, a, a low watermark and high watermark, like really close to each other? Um, so one of the things that I, that I can think of um, is that uh, again, if you're thinking that, let's imagine requests per second, that's the metric that you care about, and you suddenly got a spike on requests per second, and because, I don't know, you're selling tickets for a concert and suddenly they're, they're, they're there, and for whatever reason, could be that, um, that suddenly for a, for a while, it drops that number of requests per second, and it's going to go up again very soon. If you don't have it too low, you can basically scale down. And then if it goes up again, you have to scale up again. And remember that these scaling events are not, are not free in the sense that it takes CPU and memory from your nodes from the kubelet to spin up those replicas and get them down. So trying to not having too many scaling events one after the other, it's it's a good practice. And and how do we how can we measure or uh, th these costs, you know, of uh, scaling up or scaling down uh, from the Kubernetes nodes? Yeah, uh, definitely through monitoring. So um, one of uh, the one of the there there are many moving parts on when you have a new replica, but I think the component that it's more important uh, when you're creating a new replica of your uh, of your uh, pod would be the kubelet. The kubelet is the component on every node that is going to run, uh, it's going to communicate with the 
with a um, with Docker, for example, to run your 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 new pod. So being able to measure uh, the amount, the the number, the amount of time it takes to spin it up, the amount of CPU that your node is consuming uh, through that, I think it would be an important first step. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think we're exactly at the 25 minute mark. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for, for, for this. And again, if so if we want to know more about what you shared, uh, you know, uh, where we can find more information. So, um, for example, if you want to have a look to the watermark Porto de Scala, uh, that's on the GitHub data.org org, it's completely open source. And we also have a virtual booth here in API Days Live. So if you want to know how to monitor Kubernetes, your API-driven services, uh, I'm sure someone in the booth um, can, can help you along. Perfect, Ara. Thank you very much. It was great to have you with us. Hope to have you again in other conferences.